angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. God and the gods, who are they and uh, what's the difference? Something else that our modern church doesn't tell us, but we're going to be talking today um, about this on Skywatch TV. Uh, joining me in studio from my left to my further left, we have Sharon K. Gilbert, host of Sci Friday. Hello. Hello, how are you? Hi, honey. <laughs> uh, and then doesn't work, does it? Sharon's husband, <laughs> sitting right next to her. <laughs> she, she misplaced him. Hi, sweetie. Yeah. Hi, sweetie. Bye. Thank you, love. Derek P. Gilbert, uh, author of The Great Inception, Satan's Psyops from Eden to Armageddon. Fantastic book. It is Thank great you. to have you in studio. Thank you. And, of course, we have Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Heiser. And well, make sure I'll say to get hi, the... honey, to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think I did that to you once in a multiverse episode. But... <laughs> <laughs> Author of Reversing Hermon, Enoch, The Watchers, and the Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ. Well, it is fantastic to have all of you back again. Uh, the gods and God. <laughs> There's actually a difference here. And a lot of the church is uncomfortable with the word gods because it seems like we're talking about a pantheon. Mm -hmm. um, well, Derek, I'll start with you. Uh, it, it, with this idea of multiple gods or a single god, um, how is the idea of holy mountains actually important to understanding this war between Yahweh and these other beings that the Bible calls gods? It seems that, uh, and, you know, backing up just a step, sure. when we talked about in a previous program, uh, the, uh, the significance of the cosmic mountain or the holy mountain, the mount of assembly, the mount of the congregation, uh, mm -hmm. that since the very earliest days of humanity, we've always considered mountains to be sacred. Uh, and as Mike pointed out in that program, it's because that was the remote, pristine locations where humans didn't live. And especially from the uh, early civilizations in the semi-arid, somewhat desert region of uh, Mesopotamia, the mountains seem to be nice and watered and lush. And, you know, because the gods are gods, they get all the best stuff. Uh, but I think there's more to it than that. I think it's more than just saying, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we could live there like the gods do? I think there's a memory, and this is, you know, me speculating. Sure. But I think there's a memory that at one time humanity walked with God, as the Bible tells us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's a memory there that there is a holy mountain. In fact, Ezekiel 28 calls Eden the holy mountain of God. Right. And there's a lot of ink in the Bible, if we care to look for it, talking about a day when God will rule from His holy mountain, talking about Zion. Mm -hmm. The enemy, and this is the reason for the subtitle of my book, wants to confuse the issue. They keep throwing information out at us, like a military operation, to get us to change what we believe by feeding us information that sounds right, mm -hmm. but is wrong. And so there are holy mountains all over the planet. Now in my book I only dealt with the ones that relate to the people mentioned in the Bible, the holy mountains mentioned in the Bible. And so we've got uh, uh, Mount Zafan, which is uh, uh, Jabal al-Akra, that's on the uh, Turkish border with Syria on the Mediterranean coast. Mm -hmm. uh, that was known in the ancient world as the place where Baal's palace was located. Mm. That was his mount of assembly, his mount of congregation. Um, mount Hermon, which we talked about in the previous episode, which is where the watchers came down. But there is also evidence that uh, the ancient world believed that was where El, the chief Canaanite deity, uh, he was uh, to Baal what Yahweh essentially is to Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, that's where he had his mount of assembly with his 70 sons. Um, there, of course, was um, the artificial mountain, Babel. And the, the one that's not mentioned in the Bible, but one that's arguably the most impactful on our world today was Jabal al-Nur, which is the Mount of Enlightenment near Mecca, where mm. Muhammad received mm -hmm. his... Uh, so-called revelation from something that called itself Jibreel, Gabriel. Wow. But of course gave him a different gospel. Yeah. Um, 
but it's always seems to center, uh, key events always seem to center around holy mountains. While you're talking about that, you have given in your talks what I think is an amazing reference, and if you're trying to find a way to get your kids interested in the truth of the Bible, tell them about the smackdown between Yahweh and Hercules. Yeah. Th this is one, and Mount Carmel is, is a mountain that I missed in my original presentation, and Sharon said, um, honey, <laughs> you know, showing again why my dad always told me, son, you married up. Uh, Mount Carmel was considered a holy mountain for a long time. This is on the uh, Mediterranean coast. Uh, as far back as uh, 16th century B.C., 15th century B.C., the uh, Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose III uh, made reference to a holy headland, uh, mm -hmm. referring to Mount Carmel. Uh, there had been, by the time of uh, the prophet uh, Elijah, a, uh, an altar to Yahweh that had been knocked down and replaced by an altar to Baal. Mm -hmm. But we all know the story from Sunday school where, you know, Elijah was uh, 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 on the run. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel were searching for him everywhere, couldn't find him. He finally presents himself after three years of no rain in Israel. There was a severe drought. In fact, Ahab even says, look, let's scrounge around. Maybe we can find enough stuff to feed the animals. Even the king was having trouble feeding the horses, right. which is kind of important because they're you know, pulling the chariots that lead the men to war that protect the kingdom. Um, Elijah presents himself, said, call the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel. Let's have a showdown. Uh, and so now bear in mind that Baal in Canaanite theology was the god of storms, but he was the god of life-giving rain, necessary to water the crops, necessary to, you know, bring fresh water for people and animals and so forth. Three years, no rain in Israel. Yahweh saying, you have no power here. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a reason there was a drought leading up to this confrontation. It wasn't coincidental. <laughs> god had a reason, it, just like there's a reason for everything yeah. in the Bible. There was a reason that three years of drought preceded this showdown. So they went up to the mountain. Uh, they, uh, the prophets of Baal sacrificed their bull and they danced around, they cut themselves, they bled. Nothing happened. No one listened. No one answered, the, mm -hmm. the scripture says. It's really a pathetic sight yeah. and kind of frightening when you think about it in terms of some of the pictures we see in the news today of mm. the uh, yeah. Shia Muslims on yes. the annual yeah. Ashura festival where they mm -hmm. cut themselves with knives and bleed. Yeah. That's what the prophets of Baal they were doing. They furrowed their chest. It right. wasn't just a little bitty cat. There's a, there's a reference in... Uh, in uh, Canaanite cosmology where uh, El, the chief god, is grieving. When, this is when Baal dies and then is resurrected. Uh, he's grieving that he furrows his chest. Uh, so this is not something that's unusual in their cosmology, but nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then Elijah says, okay, he rebuilds the altar to Yahweh, sacrifices the bull, and then, again, remember after three years of drought, sends guys down to the river Kishon, says, bring up some water. Dump four big pitchers of water. Do it again. Do it again. Four times three, 12, one for each of the 12 after tribes of Israel. Yeah. After three years of drought. After three years of drought, pouring water on this altar and filling a trench around the altar, mm -hmm. and then says, oh God, you know, show them that you are the God. Boom. Now we normally hear about fire coming from heaven and every artistic representation I've seen, it looks like a holy flamethrower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think more likely it was the weapon of the storm god Baal, a lightning bolt. Oh, wow. Okay which I think is consistent with the text. Mm -hmm. And it would make sense that Yahweh is demonstrating to the people of Israel, who immediately said, Yahweh is Lord, Yahweh is... Yeah. Um, that he was wielding the weapon that Baal was powerless to wield. Mm. And that was the reason for doing it exactly that way. But the kicker to this story, as you know, uh, Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, yeah. historically, um, the, the kingdom of Tyre, which is where Jezebel came from, um, by that point in history, had replaced the worship of Baal with the worship of a god called Melkart, okay. which just in Canaanite means god of the city. Melkart um, was introduced to Tyre by Hiram, who lived during the time of Solomon, helped build the temple. Melkart was just the Phoenician name for Heracles. Oh, wow. Hercules. Mm -hmm. So huh. there's a very good chance that these prophets of Baal, which just means Lord, uh -huh. just as we say Lord instead of Yahweh, was actually <laughs> Melkart. So it's very possible that these 450 prophets who met their doom on Mount Carmel 
we're worshiping Hercules. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's mind-blowing stuff. And you that, don't see that in the Disney cartoon. Yeah, you no, never see you that, and you don't even see it in the church because you know a lot of a lot of the churches they don't deal in uh, ancient history like this. Now, something else that um, that also you don't hear in the church is about <laughs> multiple gods. <laughs> you know, because of course we worship one God. There is no other God besides Yahweh and all that. But how do we parse this out with there being other gods and mm-hmm. e- even these gods mentioned in the Bible? Yeah, uh, I, I spent a lot of time um, in the earlier book, Unseen Realm, mm-hmm. uh, on this issue, and a lot of time on, on the web as well. You know, the, the key passage, you know, would be Psalm 82, at least for the, the plurality question, where you have Elohim, Nitzav Ba'adat El, you know, God, Elohim, stands in the midst of the divine council. It has to be a singular Elohim there because of the grammar. It's a singular participle. Sorry for the grammar spasm there. <laughs> But then there's the second half of the verse is Bekerav Elohim Yishpot. In the midst of the Elohim, he passes judgment. So you have in the midst of, you, you have a group. Mm-hmm. So you have plural Elohim there. You get down to verse six, it's plural, plural language again. All the pronouns, I said you are sons of the Most High, sons, plural, all of you, gods, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, you, you look at this and you say, well, how do we parse this? And the, the key is, you know, when, when we see the letters G O D, Okay, our brain, just because of the way we're taught, either in church or just, you know, in Western civilization, we're taught to sort of assign a specific set of attributes to the letters G, O, and D. That's why when you put an S on it, it creeps people out. Mm -hmm. That is not the way biblical writers thought when they use the word Elohim. You say, well, how do we know, Mike? You know, how do we know? Well, you know, if you actually do something boring, like look up all the occurrences of Elohim, (laughs) you know, all 2,000, some of them, and actually look at them. Uh, what, What you have is Elohim is actually used of half a dozen different entities besides the God of Israel. Mm. That alone tells you that the term does not speak of a unique set of attributes. Okay. okay so we have, we have to dispense with that, and it's hard because that's the way we're taught. Elohim j- is just a term that meant spiritual being, a spirit being. Now, Yahweh is an Elohim, but mm-hmm. no other Elohim is Yahweh. Yahweh is distinguished in other passages by attributes. Okay, that's when you do get attributes talked about. Sovereignty, omnipotence, omniscience, all these things that we're we're taught, they're they're, they're correct, but they're not linked to one particular word. Now, some of those other gods show up in Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9. And this is where you get the gods over the nations thing. The Old Testament explanation for why other countries have pantheons. Well, it's because of judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, Deuteronomy 32, look it up in the ESV because the ESV uses the Dead Sea Scrolls and translates the Dead Sea Scrolls in this verse, verse 8. When the Most High divided up the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. But Israel, verse 9, is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. Mm -hmm. And I do this in the book. I do it online. If you trace through that language, language of heavenly host, terms like Elohim, through Deuteronomy, you find out that what, what's going on here is God telling us that, look, back at Babel, when I related to humanity as a mass, mm-hmm. you know, that, that was what the relationship was like. And we were okay with that. We came out of the flood. I said, now go disperse the earth because the, it's the whole Edenic plan again. He repeats the Edenic covenant. Go make the, everywhere else in the world like this, you know, mm-hmm. all that. But they don't do it. And so God says, fine. Hey, I'm, I'm done with you. I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to disinherit you. I'm going to sever the relationship. I'm going to assign you to other gods. Mm-hmm. They're going to be placeholders. Now, Paul in Acts 17 has an inkling that this is somehow related to having the nations return to the true God because he refers to when the Most High allotted all the boundaries. They, that was somehow going to bring them back to Jesus or that was the plan. Or, you know, He gets this from the Old Testament. So you have gods who are called Shadim. We didn't get to Shadim in our earlier discussions in Deuteronomy 32, 17. Mm-hmm. Translated demons, but, but that, that's a guardian entity. It's actually a, another job description. Mm-hmm. It's a term for a guardian. And that makes perfect sense. They're, they're the, the guardians of their nations now. They're supposed to direct people according to the just laws of the true God, but they don't do that. And they're condemned in Psalm 82 for being corrupt, for, mm-hmm. for causing chaos on the earth. Mm-hmm and for having seducing Israel. So there's a clear difference between the, the Most High and them, and they are in rebellion now. 
We need mm. to go to a break, but yes. after we come back, can we talk about that and how it relates to Babel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we have just barely scratched the surface yet again. Uh, more on this when we come back. Stay tuned. You know the story of Jesus Christ, but you don't know the whole story. He came to die on the cross, but he also came to undo the evil of the angelic watchers. The Hebrews of his time understood why he confronted principalities and powers on a very specific mountain. To a literate Israelite or a literate Second Temple reader, they know exactly what's going on here. It had been desecrated by the fallen ones thousands of years before. They brought forbidden knowledge to earth and a plague on mankind. This story has been lost to history until now. Dr. Michael Heiser reveals the forgotten mission of Jesus in reversing Hermon. You will learn the ancient story of the Apkalu and how it aligns with the Book of Enoch, where the stage was set for reversing the evil of the Watchers. See how the reversal of the Watchers' transgression by Jesus colors the Gospel with a picture of God's redemptive love for fallen mankind. You'll dig into the detailed writings of Peter and Paul, which allude to the sin of the Watchers and portray the hidden victory of Christ that overturned their curse against humanity. And you will discover for the first time in nearly 2,000 years how the Antichrist, the end times day of the Lord, and the final judgment connect to Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. Reversing Hermon by Dr. Michael S. Heiser. New from Defender Publishing. You've been fighting in a war against an enemy you've been told doesn't even exist. Skywatch TV wants to change that to prepare you for the battles ahead. Beginning March 7th, exclusively from Skywatch TV, the Cosmic War Collection finally arrives. Featuring three groundbreaking books, a five-hour DVD, and a seven-hour audio series showing you how real the supernatural war of kingdoms actually is. Reversing Hermon by acclaimed Bible and ancient language scholar Dr. Michael S. Heiser and The Great Inception by Skywatch TV's Derek P. Gilbert. You'll learn how Christ's full mission has been misunderstood for 2,000 years. Not only did he come to shed his blood to redeem mankind, Jesus was on a mission to reverse the sin of the angelic watchers who descended on Mount Hermon. You'll also discover how Bible stories you've known since childhood were literal battles in the spirit realm between God and the gods who rebelled. When you order the Cosmic War Collection from Skywatch TV, you'll receive Reversing Hermon by Dr. Michael S. Heiser, The Great Inception by Derek P. Gilbert, a new, exclusive, never-before-offered deluxe hardcover collector's edition of the Book of Enoch. The Real Clash of the Titans DVD, a special never-before-released video compilation with five hours of teaching on the long war between God and the gods. And The Unseen Adversary, a brand new audio series on MP3 disc with seven hours of Derek P. Gilbert interviewing Dr. Michael Heiser on The Watchers, UFOs, and The Great Cosmic Rebellion of Satanic Forces. A value of more than $100, yours for just $29.95. The Cosmic War Collection, available beginning March 7th only from Skywatch TV. Know your enemy, order the Cosmic War Collection beginning March 7th by calling 844-750-4985 or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Welcome back to Skywatch TV. You know, if you enjoy this show, you're going to enjoy all the web exclusive programs we have. Of course, we have daily updates with uh, with our very own Derek P. Gilbert mm -hmm. and uh, news updates so you can keep up to date on current events. We also have Sci Friday, which is hosted by Derek and Sharon Gilbert. If you want to know about science and its role in uh, in the Bible and our modern day, how we're supposed to handle some of the things coming in the future, you'll want to watch that show. Also, Into the Multiverse, hosted by yours truly. Quantum physics in the Bible, believe it or not, the two are compatible. Uh, well, I want to jump right back into this. And now, Sharon, before the break, you brought up a really good question. Well, you talked about the, you were essentially getting to the table of nations. Mm -hmm. And at, at Babel, not only were the languages divided, but the people mm -hmm. were divided. Can you tell us how that worked? Yeah, this is, uh, this is something that scholars refer to as cosmic geography, because 
when God judges the nations, when he judges humanity by splitting them up into nations, and he assigns them, allots them to other gods and vice versa, two sides of the same coin. If you go to Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, it's kind of the flip side of it. When, when that happens, then, you know, ostensibly it looks like God has no people. He has no family because he's divorced everyone. And that's true. He has severed the relationship between himself and humanity, which he has now divided up into these nations and assigned them to lesser beings than himself. Which is why in verse 9 in Deuteronomy 32, Israel is Yahweh's portion. Mm. So in the biblical story, when do the nations get dispersed and divided? Genesis 11. What happens in Genesis 12? It's the call of Abram. Again, it's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, these things are supposed to be read you know, in, in sequence. And so God says, in effect, I'm going to raise up for myself my own people from scratch. You know, watch. Uh, and and that, that frames the rest of not only just the Old Testament, but, but really the Bible. Because the Old Testament story from that point on is about Yahweh against these other gods who, who become rebellious, become enemies, become hostile. And then Israel against the nations. Paul inherits this worldview because he uses terms in the Greek New Testament in his letters that are used of these guys back here. Mm -hmm. And so these are the principalities and the powers and the dominions and the thrones and all this other vocabulary Paul uses. All the terms he uses are terms of geographical dominion. That's not an accident. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and, and this is a, a big part of New Testament theology as well. Uh, and when it, when it comes to, again, the, the new book, Reversing Hermon, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have connections between the Watchers, the Apkalu back in Mesopotamia, Babylonian guys, okay, this is, these are Babylonian stories, uh, other parts of Babylonian thinking that you've talked about, Derek. And that becomes part of a, a whole set of ideas that the world is the way it is because of these guys and, and because they came from Babylon and, and you know, again, they're, they're trying to, to pervert the whole situation that God was trying to, how God was trying to relate to humanity and pervert it. And so the Messiah was going to be assigned part of his job, part of his task was not just reversing what happens at the fall, mm -hmm. but taking care of business with these guys as well. And so that, you know, the new book sort of takes that as its, you know, and, starting And when point. the Mount of uh, Transfiguration, that was not. Oh, yeah, I was just table. about yeah. to ask about that. And that, that's yeah. why these books are that's so. That's good stuff. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. why these books are so vitally important for, it, for it Christians and Bible believers. It is so cool. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's phenomenal that um, uh, there's this, well, like your subtitle says, the, the forgotten mission of Jesus Christ. There's this whole part of what Jesus was sent here to do that's completely forgotten by the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it, it's not even enough to say that these books are the best written on the topic. They're, they're, they're the only. They're the only written on the topic. <laughs> yeah. A They're lot the of this books. stuff is out yeah. there in academic papers that mm -hmm. are written by non-Christians from a strictly mm -hmm. academic point of view. These guys have been found finding all those papers and, and bringing them into the Christian purview. And they're interpreting them for us and helping to teach the church what we should have known all along. It, yeah. It's really astonishing. When, when you know, I proposed the idea to, to, uh, to Tom, the Defender Publishing, um, I, I told him, I said, look, everything in reversing Hermon is going to be the product of some, you know, peer-reviewed journal articles, mm -hmm. somebody's dissertation, that sort of thing. Nobody in academia, and that's really, you know, where my home is in mm -hmm. academia, nobody has collected it and put it between two covers. Right. It's just astonishing. Mm -hmm. And so this is a first yeah. you know, in, in that regard. And the, the big difference is that, you know, Mike can actually read the Sumerian and the Babylonian, and I yes. can't. <laughs> um, but as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm kind of a history nerd. And mm -hmm. so uh, my approach is to just sort of take the, the academic papers, the, the journal, you know, articles, and try to fit them into the, the historic narrative and, and show how it, it reinforces the biblical narrative mm -hmm. because there are things that happen in history you know I mentioned in a, in a previous program about the Amorites and the sin of the Amorites and uh, the the influence that the Amorites had on world history is much greater mm -hmm. than we've ever it's been huge. taught and yeah. scholars mm -hmm. know it's this huge. I mean you know, we'll, uh, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to talk about the the Red Sea crossing at some point. One more program yeah. so, we'll talk. so yeah, we'll save it for that but yeah. I mean the the Amorites uh, arguably in terms of biblical history uh, had as much influence on the theology of the Bible as uh, I, I would argue that they were literally a tool of the enemy to try to derail God's plan 
for humanity's salvation. Quick question. Is the sin of the Amorites complete yet? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. I really don't. Um, we can, I, I would suggest not because... And if you don't know what I mean by asking that question, that is something that the <laughs> Lord says, that we're going to leave this alone because the, the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. We, we, could, we could argue that it was because he tied the return of Israel to the land that God had chosen mm -hmm. and promised right, to Abraham. Right, that 400 year period. Right, uh, when the sin of the Amorites was complete. And yet, as I mentioned, the Amorites were the ones who founded Babylon, the old Babylonian kingdom of King Hammurabi. Um, that was founded by Amorites. Scholars know this, but in the church we don't know it. We think, you know, Babylonian is an ethnicity, and it's not. Mm -hmm. It's like saying I'm a Chicagoan because that's where I was born. No, I'm <laughs> English, Welsh, Swedish, German, mm -hmm. right. you know, not a Chicagoan. The Babylonians were Amorites, and they founded this occult system that is the symbol for the one world religion, the, you know, Babylon the mm -hmm. Great, mm -hmm. that's uh, coming at the end of time. Um, it's... Uh, it's it's amazing what you just start picking at some threads here. What you find out, and then find out that <laughs> yeah, well, historians know this, and and the ancient linguists know this. And the why isn't this getting from yeah. over here to over here? It's just primary texts, uh -huh. and it, it 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 never filters down into the church. And I I am a firm believer that uh, the ministry pastors habitually, regularly underestimate the appetite of the people in their churches oh, for content. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I, I am no longer going to protect people from their Bible. That's just, I, I'm not going to do it anymore. I think people can handle it. Some of them won't. Mm -hmm. But people uh, know, I, many, many Christians have an intuitive sense that they're not being taught. There's got to be something more to it than this. And your intuition is correct. Mm -hmm. And, and again, like Derek was saying, this, this is, a lot of this stuff is like 101 for scholars because yeah. they have their heads in this every day. Mm -hmm. But it, it, you know, it, and even evangelical scholars are, are hesitant to make it part of, their, of the way they train students. And some, there are good reasons for that. Hey, we got to get through X amount of material in a semester or class. I, I get that. But at some point, you need to be teaching your students that, look, this is material that the biblical writers understood and understood well. And what they're producing responds to it, tweaks it, sometimes pokes it in the eye, mm -hmm. uses it for fodder. And you cannot possibly understand what they were trying to communicate unless you know this stuff too. Wow, yeah. that's going to take us yeah. out. Yeah, absolutely, because once again, we are out, out. of time. But uh, stay tuned next week. We're going to dig more into this. Um, just for sake of time, I'm just going to go right to it. Keep watching as we keep watch. This is Skywatch TV. mountains. While you're talking about that, you have given in your talks what I think is an amazing reference. And if you're trying to find a way to get your kids interested in the truth of the Bible, tell them about the smackdown between Yahweh and Hercules. Yeah, Th this is one. And Mount Carmel is, is a mountain that I missed in my original presentation. And Sharon said, um, honey, <laughs> you know, showing again why my dad always told me, son, you married up. Uh, Mount Carmel was considered a holy mountain for a long time. This is on the uh, Mediterranean coast. Uh, as far back as uh, 16th century B.C., 15th century B.C., the uh, Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose III uh, made reference to a holy headland, uh, mm -hmm. referring to Mount Carmel. Uh, there had been, by the time of uh, the prophet uh, Elijah, a, uh, an altar to Yahweh that had been knocked down and replaced by an altar to Baal. Mm -hmm. But we all know the story from Sunday school where, you know, Elijah was... Uh, 
uh, uh, on the run. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel were searching for him everywhere, couldn't find him. He finally presents himself after three years of no rain in Israel. There was a severe drought. In fact, Ahab even says, look, let's scrounge around. Maybe we can find enough stuff to feed the animals. Even the king was having trouble feeding the horses, right. which is kind of important because they're you know, pulling the chariots that lead the men to war that protect the kingdom. Um, Elijah presents himself, said, call the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel. Let's have a showdown. Uh, and so now bear in mind that Baal in Canaanite theology was the god of storms, but he was the god of life-giving rain necessary to water the crops, necessary to you know, bring fresh water for people and animals and so forth. Three years, no rain in Israel. Yahweh saying, you have no power here. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a reason there was a drought leading up to this confrontation. It wasn't coincidental. God had a reason, just like there's a reason for everything yeah. in the Bible. There was a reason that three years of drought preceded this showdown. So they went up to the mountain. Uh, they, uh, the prophets of Baal sacrificed their bull, and they danced around. They cut themselves. They bled. Nothing happened. No one listened. No one answered, the, mm -hmm. the Scripture says. It's really a pathetic sight yeah. and kind of frightening when you think about it in terms of some of the pictures we see in the news today of mm. the uh, yeah. Shia Muslims on yes. the annual yeah. Ashura festival where they mm -hmm. cut themselves with knives and bleed. Yeah. That's what the prophets of they Baal were furrowed doing. their chests. It right. wasn't just a little bitty cat. There's a there's a reference in uh, in uh, Canaanite cosmology where uh, El, the chief god, is grieving. When this is when Baal dies and then is resurrected, uh, he's grieving that he furrows his chest. Uh, so this is not something that's unusual in their cosmology. But nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then Elijah says, okay, he rebuilds the altar to Yahweh, sacrifices the bull, and then. Again, remember, after three years of drought, sends guys down to the river Kishon, says, bring up some water. Dump four big pitchers of water. Do it again. Do it again. Four times three, 12, one for each of the 12 after tribes of Israel. After three years yeah. of again, drought. After three years of drought, pouring water on this altar and filling a trench around the altar, mm -hmm. and then says, oh God, you know, show them that you are the God. Boom. Now, we normally hear about fire coming from heaven, and every artistic representation I've seen, it looks like mm -hmm. a holy flamethrower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... I think more likely it was the weapon of the storm god Baal, a lightning bolt. Oh, wow. Okay. Which I think in the Bible, if we care to look for it, talking about a day when God will rule from his holy mountain, talking about Zion. Mm -hmm. The enemy, and this is the reason for the subtitle of my book, wants to confuse the issue. They keep throwing information out at us, like a military operation, to get us to change what we believe by feeding us information that sounds right, mm -hmm. but is wrong. And so there are holy mountains all over the planet. Now in my book, I only dealt with the ones that relate to the people mentioned in the Bible, the holy mountains mentioned in the Bible. And so we've got uh, uh, Mount Zafan, which is uh, uh, Jabal al-Akra. That's on the uh, Turkish border with Syria on the Mediterranean coast. Mm -hmm. uh, that was known in the ancient world as the place where Baal's palace was located. Hmm. That was his mount of assembly, his mount of congregation. Um, mount Hermon, which we talked about in the previous episode, which is where the watchers came down. But there is also evidence that uh, the ancient world believed that was where El, the chief Canaanite deity, uh, he was uh, to Baal what Yahweh essentially is to Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, that's where he had his mount of assembly with his 70 sons. Um, there, of course, was... Um, the artificial mountain, Babel. And the, the one that's not mentioned in the Bible, but one that's arguably the most impactful on our world today was Jabal al-Nur, which is the Mount of Enlightenment near Mecca, where mm. Muhammad received mm -hmm. his uh, so-called revelation from something that called itself Jibreel, Gabriel. Wow. But of course, gave him a different gospel. Yeah. Um, but it's always seems to center, uh, key events always seem to center around Holy <laughs> author of Reversing Hermon, en Enoch, The Watchers, and the Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ. Well, it is fantastic to have all of you back again. Uh, the gods and God. <laughs> There's actually a difference here. And a lot of the church is uncomfortable with the word gods because it seems like we're talking about a pantheon. Mm -hmm. um, well, Derek, I'll start with you. Uh, it, it, with this idea of multiple gods or a single god, um, how is the idea of holy mountains actually important to understanding this war between Yahweh and these other beings that the Bible calls gods? It seems that, uh, and, you know, backing up just a step, when sure. we talked about in the previous program, uh, the, uh, 
the significance of the cosmic mountain or the holy mountain, the mount of assembly, the mount of the congregation, uh, mm -hmm. that since the very earliest days of humanity, we've always considered mountains to be sacred. Uh, and as Mike pointed out in that program, it's because that was the remote, pristine locations where humans didn't live, and especially from the uh, early civilizations in the semi-arid, somewhat desert region of uh, Mesopotamia, the mountains seem to be nice and watered and lush and, you know, because the gods are gods, they get all the best stuff. Uh, but I think there's more to it than that. I think it's more than just saying, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we could live there like the gods do? I think there's a memory, and this is, you know, me speculating. Sure. But I think there's a memory that at one time, humanity walked with God, as the Bible tells us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's a memory there that there is a holy mountain. In fact, Ezekiel 28 calls Eden the holy mountain of God. Right. And there's a lot of... Angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. God and the gods, who are they and uh, what's the difference? Something else that our modern church doesn't tell us, but we're going to be talking today um, about this on Skywatch TV. Uh, joining me in studio, from my left to my further left, we have Sharon K. Gilbert, host of Sci Friday. Hello. Hello, how are you? Hi, honey. <laughs> uh, and then doesn't work, does it? Sharon's husband, <laughs> sitting right next to her. <laughs> she, she misplaced him. Hi, sweetie. Yeah. Hi, sweetie. Bye. Thank you, love. Derek P. Gilbert, uh, author of The Great Inception, Satan's Psyops from Eden to Armageddon. Fantastic book. It is Thank great you. to have you in studio. Thank you. And, of course, we have Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Heiser. Well, make I'll sure say to get hi, the... honey, to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think I did that to you once in a multiverse episode. But... 